Welcome to the Atheist and Christian Book Club. We are a monthly gathering of believers and skeptics, respectfully discussing important books from both perspectives. We usually alternate books. We'll do a Christian book one month, an atheist book the next month, and we almost always have the author with us. Uh, we can interact with the author. I do want to stress that uh, we have a lot of new people tonight. This is going to be a respectful conversation. Uh, so uh, and that would include in the texts and comments if we would keep it civil. You guys have done a great job of that. And I really appreciate it. Um, my name is James Walker. I'm the co-founder of the Atheist and Christian Book Club. I'll introduce our other co-founder in a moment. Uh, I am a uh, Christian, half of the uh, Atheist and Christian Book Club. I am a, an evangelical Christian. I'm president of an apologetics ministry called Watchman Fellowship. And we are primarily focused on interfaith evangelism and issues related to that. So we deal with other religions, uh, Islam, Buddhism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, but also we have a tremendous interest in atheism. And this is why we um, we co-sponsored the club. Uh, the Metroplex Atheists uh, here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area are another co-sponsor of the club. Uh, as well as Atheist Edge, a uh, online YouTube uh, atheist channel is a co-sponsor, and uh, our ministry, Watchman Fellowship, co-sponsors as well. Uh, I'm going to introduce Bill Cluck in just a moment, uh, who is our um, other co-founder. He is a former Christian, now atheist, uh, but I'm very, very excited to introduce our guest author today. Our guest author is my friend, Dr. Gary Habermas, who is a distinguished research professor of apologetics and philosophy at uh, Liberty University. He earned his PhD from Michigan State University. He um, and uh, MA from the University of De Detroit and a BRE from William, T William Tyndale College. Dr. Habermas has dedicated his professional life to the examination of relevant historical, philosophical, and theological issues uh, surrounding the death and resurrection of Jesus. His extensive list of publications and debates provide a thorough account of the current state of the issues. He's also contributed more than 60 chapters or articles to additional books and over 100 articles and reviews in journals, uh, as well as other publications. In recent years, he's been a visiting or adjunct professor at about 15 different graduate schools and seminaries in the United States and abroad. Uh, welcome, Gary Habermas, to the Atheist and Christian Book Club. Well, thank you, James. I've been with you folks before and had a great time, and that was probably the main reason why I was uh, happy to come back again. It was a, it was a good time, and like you said, it was very polite and congenial and and collegial, and uh, those kind of discussions are always fun. Well, we're no one's perfect. So we, we've had uh, a couple of issues in the past. We won't get into it, but it's been years since we've had any kind of uh, real problems with that. The and, night's uh, still young. The night's still young. We have plenty of time to get off off topic or or something. Hopefully that will not happen this time. Now, Gary, you, you, uh, I mentioned in, in the introduction that you are a visiting professor at a number of schools. And one of those is uh, where I... I, I uh, participate as well at uh, New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Right. Uh, are you lined up uh, for the upcoming DEFEND conference this January? Yes, sir, I am. I think I've missed one of those meetings ever since they started, so I don't know. Okay. Been. I missed one, but after it's over for about the third year in a row, I'm staying after to teach a course, and as far as I know, this time is the second PhD course uh, yes. I'll be teaching there. And uh, at, at Liberty, I'm full time in the PhD program. I only teach PhD students. And that's a real blessing because when, I mean, I've, in 50 years of teaching, I've taught, you know, all levels. And, and when people say, how are the bachelor's students doing? I'll say, okay, but I wish they do their homework. And then I'll say, well, how are the master's students are doing? I'll say, well, they're a lot sharper than the bachelor's students, but these are folks with families and they do what they can and they run out of time. Well, what are the PhD guys like? Well, it's kind of exciting. We have almost as many, well, I shouldn't say almost as many. We might have a, a third of women in our program and two thirds of men in the PhD program. I had a class where I had uh, 
just one class with about 14 people. We had seven different nations represented. And if the women had had one more student, they would have beaten the guys. For mm. total so a lot of, a lot of diversity, a lot of perspectives. The We had two students from the Middle East, one from Germany, uh, one from Haiti, just, you know, like this, mm. like, like this meeting tonight, a lot of, a lot of different views. And I think that makes for a very rich, um, fun time. Well, our co-host um, uh, of the uh, Atheist Christian Book Club, Bill Cluck, has, uh, as an atheist, attended the conference that we do uh, most every year in New Orleans at the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. And uh, I don't know, if, Bill, if you're planning to come back uh, next year or not for that. Hopefully you will. We we actually spoke there, did a work, did a um a uh, dialogue, atheist and Christian dialogue last year. But if if oh. um, if you're interested in a week long apologetics, uh, having some uh, great uh, top notch speakers, and uh, you can actually get uh, graduate level credit or undergraduate credit there as well if you want to do that, or just attend for fun. Uh, that's usually the first week in January, and you can go to nobts.edu for more information on that. Well, James, so, the best thing about the New Orleans was the lunchroom where you got and met the professors like Gary and so forth. And we actually became friends with, I forgot I was an atheist in that whole thing, you know, because we had so much in common <laughs> apologetically. Yeah, and that is maybe unusual. I don't know. Uh, you, you have some of these, you know, really big names like Gary Habermas and Paul Copan and who else have we had? Uh, Brady, who who are some of the other speakers that we Richard had? Richard Howe. Richard, Richard Howe. Howe. Yeah. yeah. It, it, Doug, but, uh, we've had. But the, Doug, these guys Doug, hang Doug, around in the right. lunchroom. So when you go to lunch during the day, uh, you just pull up your tray right next to one of these, uh, you know, internationally known apologists. And uh, over red beans and rice, you talk about theology and apologetics and history and all kinds of great topics. So we enjoy Frank that. Turk has been there, too. Frank, Frank Turk yeah. is a, is a yeah. regular there. I don't know if he'll Doug be Doug was there last year. Right. And he's going to be one of our upcoming authors. I'll tell you about in a minute uh, here, at, here, here at the club as well. So uh, we're looking at this is, I think, the second or third time Gary's been at the book club with us. Uh, this this time we're looking at his book, Risen Indeed, which is a um, basically been a development for decades now. And it's uh, just a, a wealth of information. And I wanted to kind of lead off the questions and before I, uh, I go to um to Bill and uh, as co-founders, we, we're going to take the privilege of having the first questions. But for the rest of the room, and uh, we've got a couple of dozen, it looks like uh, people in the room right now. The way we work this, if you're new, is if you have a question, if you'll put it in the text that you have a question, uh, and then um, our kind of co-moderators, Daniel Ray, who's on our staff, as, as well as Brady Blevins, uh, we'll let you know when it's time, you know, we will collect those questions. So put your question in there. Uh, also, there's a, a couple of times people have had questions, but they didn't want to come on camera and ask. So you can say, would you ask this for me? This is the question I have for um, Dr. Habermas. Would you ask him this for me? And we can do that. If you don't do that, we're going to put you up on camera, ask you to unmute. So get your questions queued up right now. I, I see my friend Eric Hovine is with us, and that's exciting. I'm glad that uh, he's able to join us. I hope he has a question for you, Dr. Habermas. But I want to lead off with the first question, and then uh, before I throw it over to uh, Bill Cluck. So, uh, uh, Gary, in Chapter 9, you talk about the de development of um, uh, Wolfhart Pannenberg's uh, contribution to the resurrection stu uh, studies uh, and the subsequent something that you call the theology of hope school of thought. Can you kind of summarize this development and explain how this movement differs from like earlier approaches uh, to such, uh, you know, like such as Karl Barth or uh, Rudolf Bultmanns? Yes, absolutely. Pannenberg was one of three people that I had to treat in my PhD dissertation. <clears throat> and at Michigan State, I had to satisfy I had to satisfy three departments, history, philosophy, and religion. And uh, Pannenberg was the fellow I chose for theology 
David Hume was the skeptic, a very famous skeptic. Um, and uh, Soren Kierkegaard was a believer for sure, but he didn't think we needed evidence for faith. We just, you know, we'd say fideism today. And so I dealt with uh, Ponneberg. And let me tell you about the little contrast. We, we're in the third quest for the historical Jesus. I don't know how, how much history you want. Go ahead and cut me off. Say that, that's enough. But if you go back to Schleiermacher, Friedrich Schleiermacher, the German, in 1799, he's the father of German liberalism. And they ruled the theological roost for well over 100 years, from 1799 to World War I. In World War II, we entered a period of time called the no-quest period. And um, there was a, a reaction against history. And, and people would say, well, yeah, there's reasons for faith, but uh, why do we have to have reasons? And two very opposite theologians, Rudolf Boltmann and Karl Barth, were on different sides of the spectrum. Karl Barth, easily a Christian. Rudolf Boltmann, uh, I would say Rudolf Boltmann is to the left of Bart Ehrman. Yeah. So anybody who knows who, that wasn't a derogatory comment. I'm just saying he would never grant many historical facts that Ehrman grants. And of course, Ehrman's an atheist, New Testament scholar. He's, he says by his own testimony, he's an agnostic on some things and atheist on some things. But Boltmann wouldn't let, Boltmann didn't like history coming to the aid of faith. And so at the end of his time, the second quest came, that was very brief. And the third quest for the historical Jesus started about eight, about 1975. Panneberg introduced Christology that hadn't been seen for decades. They said his was the first move to come on the scene in 30 or 40 years because it dared to offer historical evidence for belief. And this was in the early 60s. There was a group of PhD students at, in Germany, and they were getting their PhDs, and they were well, people called him the Ponneberg Circle, but Ponneberg didn't like the name because it gave him, gave him too much notice. But his theology of hope is is hard to explain briefly, but it the view was there is a future, and Jesus' resurrection evidences Christianity. The, he, he wrote a book called The Kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is here. It's coming in the future. God's going to reveal himself all through the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection shows that what Jesus said was true. He argues a lot like in some areas what some evangelicals argue like today, but he wasn't an evangelical by a long shot. Uh, but he was a challenge to the critics. And uh, then we got into the third quest, and most of you know Tom Wright and the big name guys there. Um, and so the quest goes on. And right now, history still rules in, in religion, whether you're an atheist, an agnostic, or a theist, conservative, or liberal in any of those fields. Pretty much people today, history is in. And the question is, what constitutes history? And I guess that's why we're here tonight, because we want to talk a little bit about history. And yeah, is to, there to put that in context for a second about just for the for the atheists that are that are joining us, maybe they get, didn't sure. get a chance to read the book, especially, but it, Christians as well, for that matter. Um, this is being granted. You're you're going through in your book and you're surveying where scholarship is uh, on this subject of the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it's right. assumption. Well, that that's only only you know. Um, fundamentalist believers, uh, evangelicals that are in that study. But but what you're documenting in your book is, no, it's a wide range of New Testament scholars who are atheist, agnostic, who are very liberal. Um, uh, they, they interpret it as Jesus rose again, but only in the minds and hearts of his, of, of his disciples. And then you have, uh, uh, you know, people like this theology of hope as well. So you're surveying this. And the issue you're trying to come uh, to a conclusion on is where are we on this being an actual historical event? 
And the developments have actually been moving more towards that is, is you know, what you seem to be presenting in your book, that scholarship is agreeing on some things. So um, what are some of the things that they are agreeing on? The importance of the resurrection? What else? Well, yeah, I, I, was, I was doing my master's degree also at a critical school. And I was sitting there one night and I was wondering how to answer this particular critical view. And uh, my assignment was due and I was thinking what and what I should say. And when I thought, what will liberal scholars grant me on this subject? What will they say is a good example of a fact or a fact? Excuse me one second, I have a cough. Boy, one of those tickles that don't go away. Um, so I was sitting there, and I made a list of of arguments against this one critical response. And I said, I was writing notes, and I wrote, critics will agree to these facts. If all I had were these facts and not the New Testament, I could defeat this position that they are raising. But it's their facts that I'm using. So how would they respond if I were if I were using their data to refute their thesis? So at the end of my th that book, by the way, you're talking about um, is my doctoral dissertation from way back in 1975. You know, medieval, and the company said, "Yeah, we'll bring it out because you're bringing this big thing out on the resurrection pretty soon." and Maybe this book will help people see where you were uh, back then. But at the end of that book, at the end of the dissertation, I explain this view that I will use a few facts that everybody allows. Bart Ehrman would not hesitate to allow them. And I, I've used different numbers over the years, anywhere from three to seven. And, it, and when I say a fact, it's not just that fact. It's the data that allow that fact. Every if, if someone's going to accept facts, they accept facts for reasons. And these are the reasons that they allow. And so I've kind of my my entire teaching career is spent telling critics if if you're a scholar in this field, if your field is New Testament or theology or classics or history or philosophy, and you work with this area you are most likely 90 some percent of the time going to grant these facts for me. And I'll tell you what they are quickly here. And then I'll use that and I'll say, what does that do to some of your reasons for disbelieving the resurrection? Why am I not allowed to use your reasons against your theories? And uh, the, uh, the six that I use right now, I use six plus one and I'll explain that. I have a list of about 12 facts. I cut the facts down to six, and those six would be these. Jesus died due to crucifixion. Number two, a short time later, his earliest disciples had experiences. Everybody across the board, even Rudolf Boltmann, concedes that they had experiences. But they had experiences that they thought were appearances of the risen Jesus. Three, their lives are transformed. History is a, a record of what happened to the Christian church movement. Their lives are transformed to the point of being willing to die. A number of them died as martyrs, but you're not going to be able to prove even the majority of them died as martyrs. But interestingly enough, the ones that are the keys, the four biggest names we can talk about later, we do have first century data for both of them. I, I'm sorry, all four of them. Uh, and so their lives were changed for this material was produced very, very early. And this might be the one you might want to zero in on tonight, because this is the most revolutionary part of the discussion right now. Bart Ehrman, for example, and many other atheist and agnostic New Testament scholars will tell you that the earliest reports that we have on the nature of the gospel, the, the deity, death, resurrection of Jesus— we have that material from zero to five years after the cross. Much of it comes from zero to one year after, uh, zero one or zero two years after the cross. So 
when people say, well, the gospels are so late, oh, well, we should we should deal with that. I mean, nobody complains when when Alexander the Great, earliest novel for Alexander the Great was almost 300 years later. Uh, nobody complains when a religious figure like Buddha, you can read Buddhists and they'll tell you our religion remained oral only for 400 years. And we don't have any important writings shorter than less than 6,800 years, as one author says. So Christians go, well, okay, how does one to two years after the cross sound? And I'm using data, I'll give any number of names that skeptics and atheists will grant. Okay, then fourth and fifth, uh, I mean, um, fifth and sixth, two skeptics, Paul, uh, Paul and James, the brother of Jesus, were told several times in several early sources that James was an unbeliever, and uh, he becomes a Christian, and Paul becomes a Christian, very famous testimony. What made them turn around when they were not insiders, they were outsiders, and very different kinds of outsiders. Paul, I tell people, basically had a PhD in Old Testament. I mean, he was a, he was a, by the way, he says himself that he was a Pharisee. So he was a, a an Old Testament student. And, the, and then the plus one that I throw in, those are six, crucifixion, thought they saw Jesus, changed lives, d- proclaimed very, very early, James and Paul, and then empty tomb. We've been growing in critics who allow the empty tomb. Back when I wrote my dissertation, that book that you all are, are have for tonight, the number of scholars who would believe in the empty tomb, I'm just going to guess because I didn't do the study back then, but it was a minority view. Critics didn't like the empty tomb. They wouldn't use it as one of their reasons. And I mean, maybe between 50 and 70% would grant it. A few years ago, I wrote a book and said that we're up to 75 right now. I did a head count of scholars and critics said, oh, you're, you're way too easy on this. It's not that high. Well, I'm doing a four volume set on the resurrection right now. Um, it's 6,000 manuscript pages. It's not anything I've written before on the resurrection. I just did a new study on the empty tomb and the number has risen in the last oh, 15 years from 75% to 80% of critics, critical scholars who are willing to grant the empty tomb. But it's not as high as the other ones. Everything else I use is in the 90s. I'm just guessing. That's not a requirement, but just basically the 90s. The empty tomb is not quite that high, so I don't put it up that high. So I call it six plus one. Those are my six plus one facts that I use. And so I what you're what you're doing in this, and of course, this you you were pioneer in this what you call minimal facts. Um, right. And this went all the way back to your PhD dissertation that you started formulating right. this idea of of you're you're not saying this is something that we believe because the Bible says it or something, but you're trying to take minimal facts. In other words, if you survey the entire swath of of um, of um, theologians of uh, New Testament scholars across the board, very liberal, um, evangelical, but you're also looking at atheist agnostic people like um, uh, Bart Ehrman. So you're saying that there's a consensus here, even with unbelieving scholars, if you're in that field, that you can agree. For example, you mentioned one of those facts being that the 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 uh, disciples um, had an experience. In other words, they thought they saw something. Correct. An Correct. atheist is not going to say, "Oh, well, they saw a man come back from the dead." But even the critic is going to say, "Well, they believe they saw something." Correct. And so Correct. you're you're just as a starting point trying to deal with the minimal facts, and we're going to circle back around and talk about those minimal facts some more try to bear them out. I also want to come back and ask you, not now, but I want to ask you about um, the most prominent alternative theory to a physical resurrection. What's the best theory against it? Um, Alternative theory. But before I do that, I do want to switch over and uh, give a chance for Bill Cluck. Bill, you know Bill already, uh, Gary, but uh, Bill is a um, a co-founder, the co-founder of our Atheist and Christian Book Club, former uh, Christian now atheist, uh, Bill. You got a you got a question for Gary? Yeah. Uh, by the way, Bart Ehrman does not believe in the empty tomb anymore. He used to, That's but he correct. doesn't. Need, neither does John Dominic Cross. And they believe he was probably thrown in a common grave and eaten by dogs. Correct. 
But right. anyway, um, since Albert Schweitzer 100 years ago, the consensus has been the best way to understand Jesus is an apocalyptic prophet who had a bad weekend in Jerusalem, who thought that uh, the Son of Man was going to come, turn everything upside down, the rich would be poor, the poor would be rich, Romans would be driven out, and the 12 disciples would rule the new kingdom. Uh, we've had Bart Ehrman and Dal Allison, and both of them came to the same conclusion that indeed he, Jesus, is best understood as an apocalyptic prophet. Uh, Dale Allison said in his new resurrection book that Jesus was wrong, that he got it wrong. He clearly stated that the Son of Man would come in this generation. So my question to you, uh, Gary, is who do you believe? Dale, Bart, or Jesus? All right, let me, let me, um, I've only been with Bart once, but J Dale's a good friend. And um, in this new book, this is probably the book you mean, his his new one. Uh, this is 19, I think this is 21, 2021. <clears throat> now, critics, skeptics love Dale because Dale will take a fact all the way through this book. Dale is famous for going after that fact from 10 different directions and then tell you he's not sure which one he believes. Mm -hmm. And then later in the book, he'll tell you, well, I am kind of on this side, but these are still good questions. Here's how he opens his new book. This is chapter one, page one. It's actually page three in the book, but it's chapter one, page one. And here's his statement. Some authors like to tell you right up front where they're coming from. And uh, Dale does that. Here's the sentence. I believe that the disciples saw Jesus and that he saw them, and next Easter will find me in church. Quote, end quote. That's Dale. So he and he and a lot of people, uh, Ben Witherington, who's an evangelical, a lot of people believe this uh, apocalyptic prophet is the best way to, that model is the best way to explain Jesus. But I can tell you that since I was in grad school in 75 and uh, till today, the tables have really turned a lot. And I would say if I had to guess, it is a guess. I haven't done a head count like on the empty tomb. And you're right. Um, Ehrman, Crossan, Borg, uh, Borg's passed away. But um, they didn't believe in the empty tomb. But 80% of critical scholars do. It's it's a majority of you. I could give you a number of, of uh, big-name critics who do. But and, and by the way, the empty tomb doesn't prove anything, right? I mean, the tomb, the body could be gone, but we don't know where the body is. So right. that prove, could be grave say, robbers, as Dale says. Yeah, you don't, you don't say, oh, wow, resurrection. Right. Um, but uh, I think that – what do you think about that quote from Dale that I just read to you? Had, have you heard him say that before? Hey, we have a love affair with Dale Allison, the atheist. Paula Gia just bonds all over him. So, yeah, we love the guy. Paula, Paula, Gia, did, Paula Logia did what? He has a love affair with Dale Allison. Ah, well, here's his first book. He's got two major books on the resurrection. And in this book, it's almost as strong as the one I just read to you. This one says, he says, I'm not so sure about the empty tomb. He says, I'm a little more sure than unsure, but it's pretty close and I don't know where I am. But he says, I'll tell you where I am on the appearances. He said, I have no doubt that after, I can get a page number for you if you want. He said, With, without a doubt, if, uh, that uh, Jesus died on the cross by crucifixion and later his disciples saw him again alive. That's the old book. And then I read you the new one where he believes Jesus saw them, they saw Jesus. And I love that little thing at the end. And Easter will find me in church. <laughs> Just a little tiny. What's... Like, like I can picture he and his wife sitting there in church and his kids because, uh, you know, because he believes this. Dr. Habermas, what was the title of that book? We had a couple of people asking. Which one? The earlier uh, one. The new is, book. They're very mm -hmm. easy to confuse. The earlier one is Resurrecting Jesus. The later one is called the resurrection of Jesus. They're both. Thank you so much. T they're both published by TNT Clark. 
But you see my point, if Jesus was wrong about the Son of Man coming in that generation, yep. shouldn't we believe Dale Allison rather than Jesus? What are we believing Dale Allison for at that point? That Jesus was wrong and that uh, Dale's right, that uh, that's the best way to understand Jesus is a failed apocalyptic prophet. Okay, let me, ask you, let me ask you a question. If, and Dale does think Jesus was mistaken on that. Um, if, if Dale thinks that is so central that Jesus blew it, we can talk about that if you want. But if Dale is right that Jesus blew it, why does Dale in both of his books say, I believe he appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead? Well, we asked him, I said, road to Emmaus. He said, ah, that's probably not historical. The fish fry at the Sea of Tiberias and John. Oh, I don't know about that. He doesn't like that, one. He doesn't like that one either. Yeah. So, you know, he does, in Mark, we have no post-resurrection appearances. These are later developments, especially John, that, that chapter 20 was added later, that are clearly legendary. All right. Let, let me address both those. But I got that quote for you. If you're interested in the early quote from Dale Allison, it's right here. He says, um, I'm bound to respect rights, Tom Wright, rights and form judgment, that is, that the tomb was empty. Although I think the tomb was probably empty, I'm not sure. But I am sure that the disciples saw Jesus after his death. Okay. Now, and he said that in both his books. Now, Oh, by the way, I've got the, this new set of books coming out of the resurrection. The first one's due out in a few months. It's 1,100 pages on historical data for the resurrection. Dale wrote a blurb for me in the book. Oh, that's nice. And it, it's, a, it's like a one-liner. And I argue that near-death experiences, we talked about that before. When I came to your group, we talked about NDEs. Right. I argue that NDE shows there's an afterlife. It's an incredibly strong case. And then I argue if there's an afterlife, why would you not be, not you, but if someone grants an afterlife, which according to a recent survey, if you guys haven't heard this, a survey of atheists and agnostics only, atheists and agnostics, 32% of them believe in an afterlife. 32%. Mm -hmm. All right, so my question is, if there's an afterlife, why would we object to a supernatural event like a resurrection of Jesus, since that's in the same stream as afterlife in general? That so, makes sense. So I would thank you. I, I I would and I appreciate your your saying that, but uh, that is a question. The question of was Jesus wrong about the time of his coming? I just taught a class for PhD students on that topic at mm. New Orleans Seminary last January. So Christians raise that question too. And uh, there's a bunch of answers. And, uh, you know, some some of the biggest named guys will tell you he wasn't wrong about the time it was coming. So mm. we, we it's like a political thing. We can pick the guys that would say what we say and we'll leave out the guys that don't say what we say. And they may both they may all be skeptics or they may all be believers. But, uh, well, you know, if if I were to have started tonight. And if I were given a lecture, I, I love the dialogue format with the q and I want you guys to know I like this better than lecture by far. But if I were to start as a lecture tonight, this is the first point I would have made, and I think it's relevant uh, to your point um, on the coming. I would have said a lot of people think that you have to have an inerrant Bible or an almost inerrant Bible to be able to use it with facts and to be able to pile up good data for Christians to believe. And this guy, I got it here somewhere, here it is. This guy right here, Morris Casey, who's an agnostic New Testament scholar, and he says, he says particularly, I am not a Christian. He said, I gave up Christianity in 1962. Then he passed away in 2014. But he said, I'm not a Christian. But he said, if there's one thing I would want people to understand in the historical Jesus, it's this. He said, just because we don't have an inerrant New Testament, this is from his viewpoint, just because we don't have an inerrant New Testament or even an inspired New Testament, doesn't mean we can't use the New Testament as data. Now, Bart Ehrman does it this way. Bart says, if somebody, this is in his book, Did Jesus Exist? He says, if you ask me, if, if I'm going to do a report on the Revolutionary War, am I going to interview George Washington? 
And Bart Ehrman says, darn right, I'm going to. He was only the general, the only guy, the only the guy with the greatest knowledge. And if the response is, no, you can't talk to George. George was prejudiced. He was the first president of the United States. Use one of the Native American guides or use somebody else, but don't use somebody who went on to be to prove his prejudice. And Bart says, that's stupid. If I'm doing a report on the Revolutionary War, my sources are not inerrant, but I'll interview uh, George Washington because he has a lot to contribute. And that's the point that uh, Casey is trying to get across about the New Testament. If I took the view for the sake of this group here tonight, that I will not assume, James has already said it, I will not assume inerrancy or inspiration. I'll tell you what, not only will I not do that, I will not assume reliability of the New Testament. Let me go even worse. I will assume the non-reliability of the New Testament for the sake of this debate. I will take the view of folks over on the left. And often when I go into a university to lecture, I'll say, I'll hold up a New Testament. I'll say, uh, you guys tell me something. And the room is mixed because I'm often co-sponsored by an atheist club and a Christian club. And I'll hold up a Bible and I'll say, if the Bible is inerrant, is Jesus raised from the dead? And even the atheists go, well, yeah, if it's inerrant. And I'll say, okay, forget that. If the Bible is reliable, but not inspired, was Jesus raised from the dead? And, the, and they very smartly say, both Christians and non-Christians say, well, it depends on what's reliable, what's not reliable. And I'll say, all right, what if the Bible, what if the New Testament is unreliable? And I'll go, well, you don't have a prayer of getting the resurrection. And I'll say, okay, here's my theme tonight. I'm going to assume the New Testament is unreliable. And I'm going to tell you that based on your data, skeptics, you folks who are here, because an atheist club, you know, brings me. So I'm going to say, that based on your material, I can show a resurrection happened with what you grant. And that's just another way to say that argument outlined earlier. We have enough that everybody agrees to, um, to show that the facts the Christians claim are true. And then to go back to my earlier point, don't shut up and let somebody else talk. Um, if we already know there's life after death, and I can get that far by using atheist what atheists agree to on facts and I can get what looks like a resurrection. And when someone goes, no, 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 because miracles don't happen. Whoa, 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 time out, time out. Is there an afterlife? Well, as one very major atheist said to me in a debate, I don't want to talk about NDEs. I said, why don't you want to talk about NDEs? He said, because I've read some of the things you're going to write and you're going to use it to get advantage. I mean, I go, great, great, great. But if you're not going to, if you're not going to argue with NDEs, if you're going to allow that, you can't say there's no other world because there's an afterlife. And um, and then we go on to talk about resurrection. So I would tie all of that together. I would use the critics' New Testament, the belief in an afterlife. And by the way, that's what Dale wrote for my book. His first line was Habermas's argument that combines NDEs with New Testament evidence is a very worthwhile argument to consider. That was his uh, blurb. Well, so. we had David Fitzgerald on last month. Yes. And the evidence is so bad that he believes Jesus didn't exist. And one of the evidences is Paul in his letters never mentions Jesus' miracles, never mentions his parables, doesn't, and one of your, your one on deck, the empty tomb, he doesn't mention the empty tomb. So Paul, one of our earliest sources, doesn't seem to know anything about Jesus. Doesn't that show that this is really unreliable? Okay, here's here is Maurice Casey, Morris Casey again. He's an agnostic New Testament scholar. He says, people say that, your objection. He says, I hear that all the time. And he said, it's bunk. This is the agnostic guy. He says, it's bunk. He said, let me tell you why it's bunk. He said, the word got around the Mediterranean so quickly. Paul had been preaching it before he ever came to there. He said, the earliest book in the New Testament is First Thessalonians. It's written 48 to 50 AD, which is 18 to 20 years after the crucifixion. And the Thessalonians knew the story of Jesus so well that Paul didn't have to repeat it. And you go, well, that sounds like an argument from silence. How do you know that? And he goes, because look how the book starts. Out. First, First Thessalonians says... I'm writing to you to the about the Messiah, the Son of God, and Lord. Now, Messiah is not necessarily a 
term of deity, but son of God and Lord. He said, I'm writing to you about him, and he's the one I want to talk about. And Casey raises the question, why does Paul not start and say, time out, let me get you all in the same um, – let, let me get let us let's get all on the same page here um let me uh gary if we could break in a little bit i think we've lost your camera we still have your audio but i i don't know oh. if you can try to adjust that or or see it it's yeah thanks for telling me that i don't know okay it, I don't so, have... uh, and, and I'll, I'll mention to bill while you're working on your camera uh this has come up before at the book club and, and bill you know paul talks constantly about the resurrection of Jesus, uh, which most people would consider to be a miracle. So to say that he has no knowledge of any miracles of Jesus, I think that uh, is certainly an overstatement at best. Oh, darn, I forgot that one. I'm sorry. <laughs> Pretty important one. Hey, <laughs> hey, um, uh, James, does that work? I got a note on my computer that says we're now switching over to your default camera. Are you yeah, the default camera is not working. So uh, if you look down oh, on my screen, it's at the bottom where, oh, there we go. You're back up now. All right. All I had to do was push the start video button. So that did okay, it. Oh, and no now, problem. guess what? Now my original 3D camera, which did go off for a second, is back in again. So great. Great. Right, so, but, but the, the point that Morris Casey was making, he says he actually is really hard on it. He says, that's a dumb objection. Let me tell you why. He says, Paul doesn't start by saying, hey, I got to give you guys the 10 key facts about Jesus' life. He just starts out and says, well, here I am again. We're talking about the Lord. He said the people already knew it. And Bart Ehrman says the same thing. These guys say that they'd already been to the church. Paul had been to the church before he wrote the book. So they know the story. So he doesn't have to lay the story out again. Um, and he calls Jesus a Messiah, Son of God, and Lord. And you, you folks probably all know Lord in the New Testament is the translation of, of Jehovah from the Old Testament. So uh, Oscar Coleman, a uh, German theologian and others have said, Lord is probably the loftiest title for Jesus in the New Testament, probably even loftier than the name God, because God can, mean, his reasoning is God can mean different things, but in a Jewish context, Lord means the Lord of the New Testament. And, and you go, how do you know that? Well, Romans 10, 9, by the way, is one of those little creeds. It's from just a couple of years after the cross. Uh, even Rudolf Boltmann admits that. And it says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God's raised him from the dead, we will be saved. All right, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Three verses later, Paul quotes Joel from the Old Testament on the meaning of Lord. And Joel says, whoever calls the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's Jehovah. For Joel, it's Jehovah. So Paul's telling you, when I say Lord, I mean what Joel meant. And uh, so there's a really early came, climb to lordship. And, and back to the question of was Jesus wrong about his coming? What anybody thinks about that, here's a good question. If Jesus was a failed prophet, but the evidence shows that he was raised from the dead, if that's true, if, if it's not, I want to know what happens in his place. But if he's a failed prophet, why does God raise him from the dead? That's the way the storyline goes. Jesus is a dead man. Dead men don't do much. Jesus doesn't raise himself from the dead. God had to be involved. God has to, it's like creating life. He brought life from non-life to raise Jesus. Why in the history of religion is there no comparable event? I mean, I can pull so many things out here. Um, here is one of the latest it's a secular book with Blackwell, which claims to be the most technical research press in the world. And this is a comparison of Buddha, Jesus, and Muhammad. That's the name of it. A comparative study. And this guy decides that the worst evidence that exists is for Buddha. The middle evidence, the middle of the three is Muhammad, where it's, it's you know, fairly decent as religions go. But the evidence for Jesus is the strongest of all. And that's his conclusion of the book. It's a secular study of religion done by a secular press, Blackwell, that claims to be the leading academic press in the world. You know, calling yourself the leading academic press in the world is pretty risky when you find out that Blackwell is located in Oxford, England. Hmm. <laughs> so they're right down the street from Oxford <laughs> University, and they're claiming to be the number one. They have, I think they have 1,500 technical scientific publications a year. So 
that's just what the, the studies come out. So when I, my question is, if we don't have resurrections, and you go, well, yeah, you don't believe that because you're not a Christian. No, no, no. Tell me where there's good evidence for a resurrection in any religion. And I don't if, know any, no. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I, and if and God had to do it by definition because men can't raise men and Jesus couldn't raise himself. So if God raises Jesus, who claimed to be God's son, and he's a heretic who thinks he knows when he's coming, but he's all wet, why would his father raise a heretic from the dead when in Deuteronomy you stone heretics who make false claims about their beliefs? So if Jesus raised him, we all we all better stand back. I'm sorry, if, God, if the father raised him, we ought to sit back and go, whoa, I don't know what it is yet, but something's going on here. And there's nothing like it in a religion. Yeah. All right. it's, it's obvious that Allison, you know, doesn't believe in, in, um, in, uh, infallible Bible. No, he doesn't. Um, no, uh, he probably believes yeah, like the... some type of inspiration, but what I think what you're saying, Gary, is even uh, Dale Allison, when he can reject maybe all, almost all of John's gospel, uh, mm -hmm. certainly will, will, will reject others. It's back to that minimal facts. Even Dale Allison is going to say, you take out the Sea of Tiberias, you take out this appearance, there's still enough evidence that he right. is convinced that the disciples did see Jesus, even if you throw out those questionable accounts, I guess you could yeah. call them. And that's what he does uh, say. Right. And so, and so you still wind up, if, if Dale's right, Bill, you're wrong. Okay. Well, another thing, when, I when we were talking to David Fitzgerald, who believes Jesus didn't exist, I said, David, we're historists. We believe Jesus exists because there's so many contradictions, like in you know, Judas hanging in himself, Jesus falling off the cliff, and Dale Allison said, oh, you forgot running over by a Wilbur. You also have, you know, the two angels in Luke, the one shadowy figure in Mark, how many women are at the tomb. Uh, did he appear in Galilee as Dale believes first and the uh, Jerusalem appearances are all myth. So there's so many inconsistencies and contradictions that makes me believe that we have an aura of authenticity. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Well, see, what I would say to you, Bill, is is I, go back to the university where I tell them if the Bible is not reliable, was Jesus raised from the dead? And everybody goes, no, no way. And I said, well, I disagree with you. I'm going to argue on an unreliable New Testament, on, on Boltman's New Testament. How's that? On right. Ehrman's New Testament, on Morris Casey's New Testament, Jesus is raised from the dead. And you know, you know, there's no better person to use that than a per, to use that that testimony than a guy like Dale, who the skeptics love him because he's such a criti critical thinker. And then Dale, in both of his books, on the very first page, in the second book, he says, I believe Jesus was raised, Jesus saw them, they saw Jesus. And again, I love that little suffix at the end. And on Easter Sunday, I'll be in church with my family. It's just, he's saying, I have doubts about everything. But I think the evidence for the resurrection is solid. And if it is, that's enough for Christianity, because all, all of Christianity, according to New Testament, all of Christianity is based on the resurrection. But he does believe in the, that Jesus was crucified because he, the epitaph says uh, king of the Jews, and he says a Christian would have put son of God, Lord of sure. you know, whatever, point. whatever. But here's my question is, sure. the, and death by crucifixion is one of your minimal facts. How it come is. one one billion uh, Muslims, as you well know, believe Jesus did not die on the cross? How come they didn't get the memo? Bill, let me ask you a question, a historical question. Jesus dies in 30 AD. The second most popular year is 33. But I mean, basically, Jesus dies in 30 AD. When was the Quran? The Quran, I've already said, I gave it a, a good compliment. Of all the religious books, the Quran is one of the... It's better than most of all the other religions, in, but it doesn't compare to Christianity. Okay, when did when did the Quran get started and the death of like Muhammad? Like 632 or so? Or? Exactly, good point, 630. Okay, Jesus is 30, the Quran is 630. That's a difference of 600 years. Now, like I said, earliest, earliest biography for Alexander, P. 
plus, it's actually 280, plus 280. Earliest sources for Buddha, six to 800 years later. Okay, now Mo, uh, Muhammad's death, 600 years later. I'm not trying to be critical of anybody, but a 600, an argument that gets started 600 years later is not an historical argument. Okay. Here, here's me. If you tell me, I think John is too late at plus, got a 95 minus 30. John is too late at plus 65. I would say, you know what? I don't think so, because in the ancient world, 65 is excellent. Just believe me for now, but it's excellent. But I agree with you. I would like it a lot shorter than that. So critics bring Matthew back and Luke to 80, 85. They bring Mark back to 65 to 70. Paul's epistles start in 48 to 50. Now, Paul, you're right, doesn't give a lot of historical facts, but here's the big thing. Paul gives the years. He said, I... I came to Christ. I was on my way to Damascus, breathing out, I think he says, breathing out threatenings against the church. I meet Jesus. I go off by myself for three years, and then I return to Jerusalem three years later. Virtually every New Testament scholar, atheist, agnostic, Bart Ehrman, they date Paul's trip to Jerusalem at 35 to 36 AD. And here's the figuring. 30 is the cross, Paul's conversion is either plus two or plus three. So it's 32, 33. He goes away for three years. And at the end of that three years, he goes to Jerusalem. This is Galatians chapter one and two, which it's one of the accepted books that every critic will let you use Galatians all day long. And he's, what did he do? For 15 days, he met with Peter and James. All right, then he goes back a few years later and John is there. Now think about this. The the four biggest guys in church history are present, the mo most influential. Peter, James, John, and who did I leave out? Paul. They're all there. And in Galatians chapter 2, Paul said, I was trying to ascertain the, the nature of the gospel to see if I was running or had run in vain. So, guys, here's the gospel I've been preaching. We can look at 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and following. Jesus, the son of God, died on the cross for our sins and grace the dead is the colonel. He's saying, guys, am I wrong here? I mean, this is the gospel I'm taking to the Gentiles. If you got some problem, let me know. And he lays that out in Galatians 2.2 in front of these disciples, apostles. And he says two verses later, they, in English, they added nothing to me. And then in verse 9, they gave us, they gave me, they gave Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship. Now, in my church, at least, we don't ever lay hands on heretics. That's not something we do in our church. <laughs> but they laid hands on Paul and Barnabas. That tells me they approved the ministry. Now, sure. what ministry was it again? Paul said, I gave him the gospel I preach. He defines it, 1 Corinthians 15, 3, deity, death, resurrection. I, uh, Romans 10, 9 is a great verse for it. He gave them the gospel he preaches, and they said, go for it, brother. We'll go to the Jews. You go to the Gentiles. And uh, we're all set. But here's my point. Bart Ehrman, of all people, said one of the two strongest arguments for the historicity of Jesus is, number one, his crucifixion. Bart Ehrman gives 16 independent sources for the crucifixion within 100 years after Jesus' death. 16 sources. Many I wanted them, to ask you about that. Yeah, many of them are non-Christian. All right, so he says, Bart says, there's your one, and here's my second strongest one. He goes, what do you do with Paul going to Jerusalem at 35 to 36? Don't tell me, this is Bart, don't tell me John's too late. Tell me why Paul talking to the other big three guys isn't early enough for you. No, I agree. Um, and and not, we, not you. This is not you, Bill. I'm, I'm repeating what Bart no, says. We told that to David. He would have none of it. But you, my you know why? I'm, I'm guessing. Does he not allow you to, does he not allow Christians to use the New Testament? Um, I think he would. Yeah. Does he? Yeah. Yeah. But guys... I wanted to ask you, I'm glad you bought the 15, because I said, David, there's the synoptics, there's, uh, John, there's, um, the letters of Paul, there's the gospel of Thomas, plus there's M, Matthew special source, L, Luke special source, and Q. Do you believe in M, L, and Q? And John, John is an independent source too. So, right. so, so yeah, you got all, what do you say? So um, he doesn't believe in Q. Well, 
By, I mean, by the way, let me break in for just a second that. to let you guys know that we've we've got the last two book clubs up on our website, atheistchristianbookclub.com. And uh, anybody that wants to follow up on last month's club, we did have David Fitzgerald. His book was entitled uh, Jesus Mything in Action. And uh, we ask him some of these very same questions, Gary. Uh, and and he gave his defense of that. And, you know, he, he per- was pretty dismissive of any of the New Testament uh, sources uh, that, that we would quote. But um, now you got that Bart Ehrman question where he says, if I'm doing a report of the Civil War, am I going inter- to am I going to interview George Washington or not? He goes, you betcha I am. He's going to be my best source. And you're going to go, I'm British. That's prejudice to interview George. George is on your side. And and Ehrman would say, yeah, but George is a player. George is one of the main guys here. We've got to get George in our study. And if you guys haven't seen this, uh, Bart Ehrman's book, Did Jesus Exist? Oh, yeah, we did. He has, he has 20 pages in here going off on the mythers. And I mean, he goes off on them. He's, nas- he's a little bit nasty. He, no, says, <laughs> he says, here's one of we his noticed. lines. Oh, you already got it. He oh, believe us. Yeah. He says, he says, the mythicists are upset that people don't read their self-published books and don't give them the time of day because they think they should be players in this con- con- in this controversy. And Bart says, let me tell you something. They don't have a foothold in this conversation. They don't even have a toehold in this conversation. He said, not one of them. He said, there's two of them that I know, and you guys know that's that's Richard Carrier and Bob Bob Price. All have been guest authors at some point in our book club. We've had yeah, in the, person uh, um, Richard Bob Carrier. Good, twice we've good, had Bob Price. Bob's a good friend of mine. He has been. He's been my friend for uh, 35 years, and he'll tell you the same thing. Um, and and you know Bart debated him. Bart debated Price. You guys can can get the debate. But what Bart says is, he says, why are none of your people including your big two who are, it doesn't make fun of him. He says, Carrier and Bob, Bob's got two PhDs. He says, these guys are very well trained, but how come they don't teach at any university, college or seminary in the world? Why don't they? Uh, actually, um, you and I have talked about this uh, before, James. I, don't, I forget where you are in this, but here's Bart's comment. He goes, for a university to, to hire one of those two guys, would be like the biology department of a state university hiring a young earther. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's his illustration. But, he said, but that's how bad he's saying the mythicist argument is. He says, nobody believes it. And here's one more good argument. There is a Scandinavian scholar. His name is Mettinger, M-E-T-T-I-N-G-E-R, Tregev Mettinger. He thinks that some of the mystery religions, he says that of all the mystery gods in the ancient world, Three of them have a little bit similar stories to Jesus, more than most of them. But then he says this. He says, I think three have some closeness. He says, number one, they did not influence the resurrection. And number two, I am one of only three scholars in the world that, to my knowledge, uh, thinks there are any. That favors Mm. what Bart said. Mettinger yeah. says, I take that view, but I'm one of three, and every other skeptic rejects my view. Yeah, I think we, we showed a, a video of Bart Ehrman receiving the um, the Freedom from Religion Foundation Man of the Year Award, the Emperor Has No Clothes Award. Okay. And a question is, he's taking the award, this video is amazing. He's uh, Somebody asked him about there's no history for Jesus or something, and he just takes off on him and says... Uh, bottom line he says when when he when he he has talked with the brother of jesus and his closest disciples and he's the eyewitness to the brother and the closest disciple how can that happen if the if jesus doesn't even exist and then he 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 basically says that um this is an embarrassment for atheists and agnostics this idea of jesus mythicism and i will say that our group our, our the atheists they're part of our book club are divided on that whole issue of mythicism and um, probably most of them more of more than not are, are going to be uh, believe that Jesus was historical, that he wasn't God and he didn't do miracles, but he, there was a historical Jesus 
So I don't want to put words in in their mouth, but I, I that's my my feeling on the atheists. And in fact, in the notes, uh, those of uh, those of you guys who are atheists, if you could do a little quick poll and just put, um, uh, I'm an atheist and I believe Jesus didn't exist, or I'm an atheist and I believe Jesus did exist, that might help us get a poll of where you guys are. So. Uh, I did want to, to um, before we get any further, to take uh, we, we've already almost halfway through our club for tonight. But um, uh, Brady, did we have a couple of questions from our club members? That yes, we do. We have a couple. Uh, we'll start. I'm just in order that I got them. Uh, Mike Cahill, Mike, if you would uh, go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Hi, thanks a lot. Um, first of all, I'm glad to know how to pronounce Habermas because I didn't know before. There's English spelling is so weird. Anyway. Um, yeah. And also, I've been enjoying this talk a whole lot <clears throat> more than, dare I say, the book itself, uh, just because it's been lively and everything like that. Um, I noticed when I was reading the book that this is in the form of a dissertation. It was your dissertation. And that was that's really great. I could say, OK, he's doing a literature survey. This is how dissertations start out. And that actually was the bulk of it. Um, but I was really surprised, almost shocked to see that it came from Michigan State University, secular university. And here's this fairly Christian oriented dissertation. Been just wondering how in the world you got that accepted at a secular university. And uh, do you think that it would, would even be possible today to have that accepted at Michigan State or? I think it would somewhere? be. Yeah, you've got to know where to go. And it might help to get an in with somebody you, that you know somebody from the opposite view, and he's a friend of yours, and he teaches in the department just to get you in. But here's what they told me. I Today, committees are usually three people. Then I had a six-person committee, and three of the guys on my committee believed in the resurrection, and three of them did not. Wow. So they were, they were evenly represented across discipline – and the most complimentary guy of my dissertation was a Jewish professor of history. Hmm. And he gave, my, he gave me my dissertation back at the oral defense, a really nice guy. He was a Renaissance uh, Enlightenment specialist. I, I loved his classes. And, and um, he said, I think your evidence for the resurrection is pretty good. He said, I'm Jewish, don't believe in the resurrection but I think you've got pretty good evidence. However, I think you've left out the number one evidence for Jesus' resurrection. Now, imagine the chagrin when he handed it to me. In those days, we had all the loose leaf in a, in a typing box, and he handed me the box with 350 pages in it. And he said, I bet you're interested in what I think is the best evidence for the resurrection. I said, "I whatever it is, I want to know why I left it out. He said, okay, here goes. You said nothing about the Shroud of Turin. Oh. <laughs> that was in 1975. Now, since then, I've written two books on the Shroud, co-authored. And my co-author is one of the scientists who did the 1978 investigation, Ken Stevenson. And I've been involved with the, they call themselves the Shroud Crowd. I've been involved with those guys for years. I don't think, I think the historical argument is much stronger for the resurrection than the Shroud is. But the Shroud should not be taken lightly. It, it is... Uh, a decent argument. But when I started that program, one of the other guys who did not believe in the resurrection, here's what he said to me. I said that to him. I said, uh, I'm surprised that you're letting this topic go. And he, here's what he said. He goes, Gary, at Michigan State, we're liberal, but we're good liberal. He said, let me tell you the difference between good liberal and bad liberal. Bad liberal prejudges things and won't let things go no matter what the evidence is. They won't give it a chance to start. He said, if you have a decent argument, we will grant you the PhD even if we disagree. If you think you, if we think you put a good argument together, the degree is yours. So basically what he says, what I'm saying is we're going to be fair with you. We can disbelieve, but we're going to be fair with you. And I think that's the reason. They were very, very fair. And uh, they just read the stuff, and in the oral defense, they were saying, well, who's going to start us? No no replies. Okay, does anybody have a question? No replies. 
come on, guys, we're here for a reason. Somebody give her and and all right, when it started, I could have been better prepared for the oral defense because they made up naturalistic theories. And they said, why couldn't it be hallucination? And when I gave like five responses. I've got an article published where I give 19 responses to it. The guy goes, okay, all right, next. And someone else goes, well, why couldn't this have happened? And I give an answer and they go, I'm done. Who else? And it went on for two hours, but for most of the time they made up these theories. And at the end of the time, they realized that's one of the main problems. There's not much out there. And today, I can tell you guys a trend. Today, the sharpest critics have backed off picking naturalistic theories. They generally don't pick them anymore. And Bart, Bart Ehrman tells you why. He says, when I was an evangelical, we used to beg the people we witnessed to to give us a naturalistic theory because you can shoot them all down. And he said, so when they would give a theory, we would lick our chops and dive in with the refutations. And he said, a lot of non-Christians aren't aren't prepared for that. They're not used for these guys coming back with, with comebacks. And he's, and, and then he used, he said in one of his last books, he said, I won't pick a naturalistic theory anymore. He said, even the worst theory, the disciples stole the body. He said, even the worst theory there is, is better than a resurrection because a resurrection is supernatural and we don't know a supernatural world exists. Now, if I'm in a debate, I'm going to go, I'm going to go time out, time out. There's an assumption there. Yeah, if I say, well, first of all, I'm not a specialist in God's existence, but a lot of the guys in our group, in our large group of apologetics, they could, they would defend a moral argument or Kalam cosmological argument. My, my favorite is intelligent design. Um, I would use those and say, well, if God exists, you can't use that objection anymore. But here's the one I use, and I've already given it. If near-death experiences are true, I published an article. Anybody who's interested, I'll send you a copy of this article. I note there's over there are hundreds of evidence near-death experiences. And for anybody who thinks they're very uncommon, in a recent medical book on the subject, a medical book, they've estimated that 20 million people alive in the world today have had near-death experiences. And here's mm -hmm. the funny thing. When you're up above your body, they claim they are, and they say to the doctor, Quit beating on me. Quit beating on me. Just leave me alone. I want to go. Just let me go. I saw my mother and I saw my father. And I'm ready to go. Quit beating on me. Well, the doctor doesn't ever look up at them and say, excuse me, but I'm trying my best to save your life. The doctor doesn't know they're talking to them. So they're in another realm. So when people say resurrections don't happen because there's no other realm, my first comeback is refute near-death <clears throat> experience. Yeah, I'd be interested in that. Maybe James could uh, give you my contact and you could send me James, that. James yeah. or Daniel, I could send it to Somebody. both of them. They probably yeah, I just I just put a note in. I, 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 if you will include your email address with NDE by it, uh, we will make sure you get both Gary's okay. article and also the two podcasts we did with Gary uh, at Watchman Fellowship on near-death experiences. And uh, okay. it was, it was I thought, kind of fascinating. It's a video Um uh, on that now, as well. All I'm so. saying there is, if the path is open to an afterlife, is there? If there is one, there's no more legitimate reason not to study the evidence for the resurrection. You know, I had one more question. This is exploring the the middle section where you say, "Here's here's another possibility that Jesus' resurrection happened, but we can't prove it." And yeah. that seems like the weakest section in the whole thing. And and I think you very legitimately go after. Like, how in the world, what, what makes you think that, why would you even choose Christianity if you can't prove it? And by the way, you're arguing, you're, you're, you're arguing and basing your argumentation on reasoning anyway. So why just say that you can only do it on faith if you're that's, using that's reason great. itself to argue it here? Folks, I'll tell you why. And if you've never done this before, it's one of the most interesting things you could do when you're a group of people. Ask people in your group one day, you know, some of you have faith, some of you don't have faith, but those who do or don't ask them, if you were into these questions, would you need evidence or not need evidence? Mm. And when I ask my PhD students, let me give you an example of my own family. My dad was special forces in World War II, a, a hardened soldier who had been was fighting in Germany when he was 17. My mom was a soft-hearted 
you know, your house is your castle and, you know, you come to us anytime and tell us anything. I was married to a gal who died of stomach cancer in 1995 and I remarried and both of my wives, isn't that a strange phrase? Both of my wives would be in the same class as my parents. I lived with my grandparents for a few years and both of them, man and woman, would be in the same category. Here's what it is. They would say, I don't need any evidence for the resurrection. No. They go, well, look, I'm glad when the pastor brings a speaker in every year and does it. I'm glad when the pastor brings an intelligent design person in every year and we have a little conference on intelligent design. I'm happy for it, but it doesn't make my faith stronger or weaker. And I asked my wife recently, if somebody asked you what seemed like a devastating objection to the resurrection and you didn't have a clue how to answer it, would you go, oh, no, and start doubting? And would your faith go down a little bit? And she said, absolutely not. And I can tell you from interviewing so many of these people, they will say, not one iota. It doesn't go up when you give me evidences, and it doesn't go down when they give me objections. So I under, I, let's just put it this way. I understand that middle view. I don't like it very much. But if I were honest with you, I would tell you I wished I could be like that sometimes. It's mm. very convenient. <laughs> Yeah, and I can see there's people who, you know, don't don't confuse me with facts, my mind's made up, and we can see that in um, other spheres other than religion, we'll just leave it at that. Um, so I, I do appreciate that that particular chapter, but the rest of them too, you've, and you've done... By the way, the guys in that middle chapter were believers. They were believers, they just really didn't wild. think evidences for the, that, that evidences for the fact had anything to do with anything. Yeah. And I have to I have to grant their view, even though it's not mine. I have to grant that they're convicted and I appreciate their faith, even when they don't try to build a castle of facts. Yeah. Well, I'll let somebody else interact with you now. So thank you very much. Um, You're welcome. Thank you, Mike. Okay, we have a another question for you, and they've asked me to read this. This comes from Thumper Delta, uh, and they they this is what they wrote. Please ask for me, although I realize that the topic is the resurrection, there is substantial discussion of the crucifixion. Do you have any research details on the uh, quote-unquote method of crucifixion? I'm alluding to the JW stance of a stake instead of the cross. Now, before you answer, Gary, I want to put in a shameless plug for Watchman Fellowship. We have a, a course coming out probably in January of next year on um, Islam, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Mormonism. And, uh, and this is something that we do get into on the Jehovah's Witness part of the course. So if you're really interested in digging deep, we, we have a whole course um, uh, about this coming up here uh, just after the year turns over. But Gary, if you would, uh, could you give an answer to that? Sure. I can give you a whole bunch of tidbits. Um, so many, I don't even know where to start. Um, let's say that uh, the majority view, I work with a medical doctor, actually an MD, PhD, and another PhD, and we did an article for the Baylor a Medical Journal on how does crucifixion kill you? How do you die by crucifixion? And majority views, we did a head count. Head count doesn't prove anything, but this tells you where the lay of the land is among medical doctors. And the view that death by crucifixion is these essentially death by asphyxiation is by far the most common view, but I understand a lot of doctors don't like it and that's fine. Just like the one we just gave, uh, we have to respect all views, but we gave a chart and there were twice as many proponents of death by crucifixion being death by asphyxiation as there were twice as many as all the other views put together. So, True or false? I mean, that's just a way to start. Okay, now on the cross. Maybe the JWs or maybe the, some of these people look askance at me if I said this, but I would say, I don't care what kind of a cross it was. You know why? The Bible doesn't describe it. And you go, oh, no, it said that they took this and then they nailed them to the cross beam. Well, yeah, but there's different ways you can take that Greek and different ways you can take the cross. So let's just say... Um, it's a stake in the ground. I don't think hardly anybody thinks that in, in history. But take it's a stake in the ground. Take it's a T-shaped cross. Take it's a traditional kind of cross like this. Take whatever kind you want. The 
problem is when you're hung in that position, you go, what about the stake? There's no way to put your arms. Okay, here, here's what happens. On a stake, you die faster because you get nailed with the, and by far there's way more nails than ropes, way more in the literature. But your hands go above your head and the closer your arms are to your head, the faster you asphyxiate because it constricts on those intercostal, pectoral and deltoid muscles. The, mu the muscles you work on in a gym, uh, it constricts. Okay. Now, some people are going to say, I'll just move on a bunch here and you can jump in. Bart Ehrman, I've told you, gives 16 independent sources within 100 years for the crucifixion of Jesus. He says it is one of the indisputable facts in the New Testament, Jesus' death by crucifixion. Um, here's another one. Somebody might say, well, where did the centurion go to medical school? Did he get an MD from Johns Hopkins or what? And how would a centurion know if he's dead? Well, let me tell you something we know from history. First of all, soldiers may not pass an it. First century soldiers may not pass an exam, uh, an anatomy exam, but they know where to strike to drop you in your tracks faster. They don't stab your arm. They stab to the middle of your chest because they see how fast people drop. And so they know where to stab. But let's talk about history for a second. Uh, Jesus was dead. Well, on the asphyxiation view, how do you know he's dead if you don't have a medical degree? If you're hanging on the asphyxiation view now, if you're hanging in the low position and you don't move for, let's say, 15, 20 minutes, you're dead. You cannot fake death by crucifixion in the low position. You can't breathe in the low position. So you'd have to push up to get breaths as the two the two on either side of Jesus and as Jesus did, because you have to be you have to have free lungs to exhale. And and uh, if you're there for a long time, you're dead. So what happened? The Jews required them to take the bodies down. They broke the ankles of the two men on each side of Jesus. Okay, let's time out. Why did they break the ankles just to kill them? Were they just being mean? See, if they break the ankles, the guys can't push up. And if they can't push up, they can't breathe. So it's it's pretty quick. It's pretty um, quickly. It's pretty over pretty quickly. But here's the big thing. Um, two good arguments that we ended our medical article with in the Baylor Medical Journal. We have Roman sources that say it was typical to strike a blow to the dead body after it was dead dead when a family member comes up and says give us our son back please we're going to bury him it says in one roman source actual an ancient roman source says the centurion may give the body to the family the dead body when they take the body down and strike a final blow when the body's on the ground the latin word for strike is a military term and it's a term where, where it's used in context. It refers to axes, spears, or a sword. So they took the person down, and the person either speared the body, put an axe in the middle of the body, or stabbed all the way through the body. Now, the person's already dead. But the source says, when the centurion saw that the man was dead, he told the family, he told the family they, may, they may have it. Um, I've already told you one another thing. Nails are way more common than ropes uh, for the process. The, the two biggest things I would use for crucifixion are the one I just gave you, that the spear wound is historical. Because they came to Jesus, and basically the centurion, they, he could have said, yep, he's dead. No, but the centurion thought, not on my watch. And... He, he stabbing the body while he was on the cross is like taking the body down and stabbing him again and giving him to Mary and John, giving the body. Secondly is what's called the David Strauss critique. This was developed by a very famous skeptic in, the, in 1864. And Strauss was so liberal that in liberal Germany, he taught at the most liberal university in liberal Germany. He got kicked out of the university for this argument because it offended the liberals. <laughs> That's all. And, and when David Strauss died, he died a disillusioned man who gave up his belief in God and an afterlife. Very sad individual. But David Strauss says this in his life of Jesus, and it's a famous critique of the swoon theory. 
he says, if if Jesus, the one who claimed to be the son of God, the conqueror of the world, going to sit on God's right hand, if that person is taken down from the cross and he's not dead and he comes to, David Strauss says the problem isn't what shape he's in on the cross or if he died. The problem is what's going to happen when he gets to the place where the disciples are and he's going to knock on the door. He can't stand up. He's worked his, he's worked his wounds back open. You could track you hunters. He, you could track the trail back of blood back to the tomb faster than you can track a deer in the woods for crying out loud in an open street. It's easier to track the blood. And Jesus walks in and he says, I told you I would rise from the dead. And he faints or he sits down or whatever. And, and the point is, a swooning Jesus wouldn't convince anybody that he was dead. But the fact that the disciples thought Jesus was raised from the dead is unanimously held by every good, well, I say good, I mean somebody's in the field, a, a trained New Testament scholar, everybody says the disciples truly believed him to be dead. And if, if, they believed him to be dead. How can you explain it if the warmed over milk toast Jesus comes to the door and says, guys, I told you, I told you I would live and he can't talk. He can't walk. He can't stand up. And he dies three days later. Cause you know, like in even the civil war infection killed more people than bullets did. So mm. they would have to get Jesus through that infection. So the so-called Strauss critique is still the reason today while even liberals say the swoon theory is a joke. Hey, Gary, not- I, I just wanted to, to add right. something. You mentioned the nails being the predominant more than ropes. And Easily. that that, that uh, reminds me of an issue. We have an article at our, our website at watchman.org. And maybe Brady can go look for that article under torture stake. But the Jehovah's Witness position on the crucifixion was that it was not a cross, and they they abhor the cross, but it was a what they call a torture stake with both hands. They have illustrations of a pole, a stake in which Jesus is crucified, both hands over his head with a single nail going through both wrists. But it's interesting in John's gospel, when Thomas, doubting Thomas, is saying, unless I see in his hands, the print of the nails, plural. He doesn't say nail, which a a stake would allow for, but uh, you would have to have at least two nails if it's going to cross, and one nail would suffice to go through both wrists if it was uh, on a torture stake. So even the text of um, the gospel seems to indicate that uh, a cross. They also, in that article that we have on our website, uh, archaeologists discovered the actual remains of a crucified man from Jerusalem uh, yeah. in ossuary. There was a a, a uh, nail through the um, the heel bone of the person, and the heel and and also the upper arm. About halfway up, he's nailed. Right, and he's the, the, uh, yes, okay, correct. And and they surmise from that, and I can't remember the argument of why, but that it would have been either a T shaped or a traditional cross. They believe um, traditional cross. Not a pole. But, yes. but I will tell you this. I'm sorry. That's just one crucifixion victim. We now have, and I just write this out, it's in my first book that comes out in January, Lord willing. Uh, we now have about five real or potential crucifixion victims whose bones have been discovered. And we know more about crucifixion today than we've ever known before because of these dead bodies. There's other ones with not with a nail through their heels, but with a hole through their heel or a hole through the top of their feet. Mm. I, 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 did have, I know we have some more questions, but I didn't want to get this one in real quickly. We had uh, Hannah, I think had a question. Hannah, so yeah. It should be easy, easy one. And she, but she asked if we would say, ask for you for her. <laughs> so Gary, what's your ba- uh, favorite Bible verse? And very briefly, how did you become a Christian? I don't know my favorite Bible verses. I could tell you like maybe five of them, five candidates I have. Uh, one is First John 5, 13, because when I, I went through doubt for 20 years, I used to debate Christians. And when John says we can know we have eternal life, that interests me. Um, another one is Philippians 1, 21 to 23. My wife died. 
my family was devastated. And I love what Paul says, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. And two verses later, he says, I prefer to die and be with Christ. And, and the Greek there is very strong. It's sometimes translated like this. I prefer to be, die and be with Christ, which is better, comma, far better. And so that verse about what heaven is and expectation, um, I love that one. I, I'm getting to love Romans 10, 9, maybe my favorite now, because it's an early creed. It comes from the early 30s AD. Uh, critics will have to tell you how to get there, but all these guys are going to admit this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, there's the high deity, and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. I think that verse says it very, very nicely. So there's a few candidates for you. I don't know if I have a favorite. Depends on what day it is. Uh, yeah. Did you ask me another one? Yeah, yeah. She, she was oh, also I wanted to know, uh, yeah, very, very briefly, uh, yeah. how, how did you become a Christian? I was raised in a German, uh, well, I was going to say German Baptist, but I was actually raised at a Methodist church. I was sprinkled as a baby. My parents moved out to the suburb, and there were no Methodist churches out there, but there was a German Baptist church right down the street, so we started going. And we fell in love with the Baptists. We didn't know who they were. We're not a super religious family at that time. And when I was quite young, the closest person in my life died. It was my great grandmother. And you might say, how can your great grandmother be the closest person? I, I, I'll short change my testimony and just say, just believe me, she was. And she died when I was eight. A few years later, I started doubting my faith. All right. Way later, my wife died in 1995 of stomach cancer. So I tell people my doubt is framed by two deaths. The two deaths of the most important people in my life, my great grandmother and later the wife and mother of my four children. Uh, God brought me through that doubt. It was agonizing for 20 years. And again, I used to debate Christians. I used to I was very skeptical of, of a lot of things. Hey, get this, folks. And for some of you skeptics who are there who are thinking about this, after I earned my PhD, this is not something that happened when I was 12 years old, okay? After my PhD, I almost became a Buddhist. Um, and the Lord rescued me. But the point is, and not the, the typical read the, you know, Sanskrit or something or Hindu, but it was a, a, a new trend among Buddhist studies. And, and I had to be, I had to study it and go away from it. So I was serious. It was after my PhD. So to the Lord's credit, it was the resurrection that got me through my doubt unquestionably. And it's not just that Jesus was raised and that there's an afterlife, but since God is required to raise Jesus how can you explain it any other way than that he approved of Jesus? If he didn't approve of Jesus, if Jesus was a false prophet, what is he doing raising a heretic? That's not how we do things in Christianity. And that's not how Paul did things. So why did he raise Jesus? I got a feeling we can't explain every last thing, but I got a feeling Jesus is right, Jesus is right, we're wrong. And God proved it was right by raising him from the dead. So that little argument, he was raised and God proved his teaching was right by raising him, I could not get around that argument. Gary, I have a quick question. Um, as I was reading the book today, I mean, I've, I've read this before, but uh, the way you have put it in your thesis was fascinating. Why do you think that liberal higher scholastic criticism of the Bible was so prevalent in 19th century Germany. Why, why that? Is there a reason or is, is that just a, we don't know? Yeah, I, I don't know why I'm German. So I understand this kind of stuff. And, and the Germans, I'll tell you a fact that you might find very interesting. The Germans from 1799 Schleiermacher up until 1860, they did not have a critical text by that. I mean, they didn't have a Greek text that they could do studies on the Greek. They didn't have that text. and But they didn't read Brits. They didn't read Americans. They didn't read anybody but, but Germans and a few odd Scandinavians. They thought they were the only ones worth reading. And 
1860, they found out that Cambridge University had three budding young scholars, Westcott, Hort, and Lightfoot. And these guys had made a critical Greek text. It's the same Westcott and Hort who said in 1905, we have 90, we have a 95% pure New Testament text way back in 05. And the Germans brought that text in and re revolutionized German liberalism. They had to read the guys they couldn't stand reading. I, I don't know, though, Daniel. I, I don't know who I, why I would say that happened. Uh, you'd think the more we go on, the more liberal we are. But the, the liberals were more liberal than almost anybody writing today. The guys doing hmm. the third quest today, even the critics, are almost like, um, they, well, I'll put it this way, they grant a lot more. Bart Ehrman, for all people who don't understand him, don't like about him, uh, Bart grants a lot of historical facts in the New Testament. And I think that's the state today. People are realizing the evidence is just that good. But I, I don't know why that, why, uh, I guess it was a, a, you know, a freak event of history or something. I'm sure God has had his, had his hand in it somewhere, but I don't know how or where. Does it, does it come out of, um, I know it's hard to, it's hard to put all this together historically. Does it come? Is it any offspring of the Enlightenment of the 18th oh, for century? Sure. For sure. It it just seems to have taken root more solidly. And yeah, I can tell you it, a little. I can tell you a little. Yeah, time go ahead. When the Enlightenment was coming in, Descartes. If how much of a philosopher you guys are, uh, when Descartes, Spinoza, and Leibniz were doing German rationalism, it was called when they were doing that. And then in England, it was called English deism. And they had a bunch of reprobates, just weirdos, because these guys were not, they were not scholars. They were not trained, but they went around and said the disciples stole the body and every silly thing you could think of. You, they could have thought of a lot better theories, but disciples stole the body and, but they weren't good scholars. They were like journalists and everybody kept slamming them with things, but that was going on in England. Rationalism was going on in Germany and liberalism was born out of those two movements, the okay. deism of Britain and the rationalism of the continental Dutch and German and French thinkers. Can you, um, I love the part that I read today about how you really, I mean, a lot of people have criticized David Hume's skepticism, but right. I really like how you broke it down in your thesis. Um, can you give us a little like, uh, you know, five points on uh, on what what's wrong with Hume if you had five minutes on a plane what uh what's the one thing how could we tackle Hume what uh, I, I liked how you did that I really it was is really very well put together and, and I learned a couple of inroads into how to to look at Hume's writing so thanks for that could you kind of explain what what you think is primarily no, wrong I with Hume's? I didn't update that thing from 75 so it's 38 what is that uh 48 years later and I would be very different about my critique of David Hume today. One of the critiques I gave okay. there, I would I would hold because I think it's maybe the best one. But a second one has come up. Uh, just a, a, 19, a 1998, an essay was published that argued the second one. But today, there's a lot of work on David Hume, and the general the general feeling is to reject him. Most scholars reject David Hume. The, if if anybody wants to read a book that just rakes him over the coals. It's called Hume's Abject Failure. I think it's published by Oxford, which tells you they're not messing around. This guy, I believe, is not a Christian. He's like an agnostic, the author. But he argues that uh, Hume is, is a horrible failure, his argument. And do you guys know that in his own lifetime, this is hearsay, but in his own lifetime, he told a person who recorded it, that he had been beaten in a written debate by a Scottish Christian pastor named Campbell. Now, there's two Campbells. That's not Alexander Campbell from the U.S. It's a different Campbell. But they debated, and he said, Campbell bested me. Imagine living in an age where pastors were the sharpest guys around, and they took on the famous skeptic David Hume from Edinburgh, and uh, and David Hume said, I lost the debate to him. But here's the two arguments I would give. One is by George Mavrotis, a 1998 article in the J International Journal for Philosophy and Religion. And he says this. He said, David Hume's essay 
is very, very poor mathematically. So poor that it's self-refuting. And here's how he explains the article. I, first time I read it, I thought, this is really creative. The Mavrota says, so he goes to the pub and he's having a pint with his best buddies. He was, in a, libra he was a librarian at, at uh, Edinburgh. And they're having a pint after work. And they're sitting around and David Hume takes a little, I'm just picturing this. And David's taking a little survey. What do you think about miracles? What do you think about miracles? What do you think about miracles? Do miracles happen? And let's just say all of them said, oh, no. Miracles are stupid. Miracles don't happen. So David Hume writes in his essay, there is a full proof against all miracles. Miracles do not happen. There's no evidence. But he says it's a full proof, no data for miracles. And George Mavrotis, who was a professor of, until he passed away, a professor of philosophy at University of Michigan, and he goes, time out. Let's think about this little survey. Where did David Hume do his little survey to find out that nobody believed in miracles? He said, I'll give you a couple options. It was his buddies in the pub having the pint after work. Those are the guys he used. Okay. All right. Second option. It was a survey of his, one of his classes at Edinburgh. He asked them what they thought. Mavrota said the problem with these scenarios is they didn't do sophisticated surveys in those days. He didn't have any data on what people believe. How does he know there are no miracles reported in the data? How does he know that? He says either David Hume's sample is too small, the boys in the pub, either the, the sample is too small, in which case his message is uh, wrong, or, and here's the key, or he starts asking a bigger group, maybe 500 people. But as we all know today, if you ask 500 people, do you believe in miracles? A good number are going to say they believe in miracles and they have an example in their own family. So either David Hume's sample was too small, in which case he loses, or in which case it's if he made it bigger, he's going to lose because they'll report miracles. And he says there are no miracles. So he didn't have a good sample size. His statistics were faulty. So it's a, it's a logical fallacy. Uh, uh, it's an inductive fallacy. That's one. Here's my second one. And we've been all around the bush today on this one, but I still like this one best. And there were pastors who were going after David Hume in the 17, uh, about 1760 and using this critique on his article. And here's what they said. If God possibly exists, and they'll go time out. I'm not saying he does. I'm not saying I have a good argument. I'm not saying I can prove it, but if God exists, you're asking the wrong question. C.S. Lewis did this. You're asking the wrong question. If God could exist, the question is, if God could exist, the question is, how do you know God being outside the system or outside this world or something of that sort could not do a miracle in nature if he so chose to do so? And they can say, oh, he doesn't exist. He doesn't exist. And they would go, time out. I suppose you want to give me an argument against God's existence then, right? You're going to disprove God, so I don't have to think this way. Well, here's the key. You cannot prove atheism is true. There's no proof for atheism. A lot of stuff's coming out of this now. Become an agnostic, but don't be an atheist, because there's no proof for atheism, no way to prove it. And if there's no proof against God, then what are you doing to rule out miracles? You're assuming there's no God. You're assuming there's a good reason, and you don't have any reasons for it. You cannot disprove God. So I'm, I, my, the argument would be, if there is a being that's greater than the universe and he chooses to act, who would stop him? And they're going to, here's their comeback. You can see it coming. Well, what if there isn't one of those? And I'm justified in not looking. And the objection says, you're answering the wrong question again. Here's the wrong question. If God possibly exists and could possibly do something, you need to examine the evidence. How else would you know? You need, no, I don't have time for that. Well, then you don't have, you don't, you're not serious about trying to refute this. See, they don't have proofs against God, but you don't have to have proof for God. You can just say, if there were, if there were a God, why aren't you spending the rest of your life seeing if the resurrection happened or if there's an afterlife? NDEs. If there's an afterlife, you better do some thinking before the time grows too short. There's mm. consequences here. Mm.
So I think that's the second best one that says, I don't have to prove God. I think you can, but I don't have to prove God. If he even possibly exists, why aren't you looking at the data? Um, okay. I think we've got uh, Ken Daniels. I don't, um, Gary, I don't know if you remember Ken from last year at the, at the club, but um, Ken has got a question that okay. goes back to the earlier discussion about Dale Allison. Uh, Ken, right. you want to unmute and, and, and ask uh, Gary? Yeah, I wanted to start by thank you for being here. It's, a, it's an honor to have you. And uh, I do appreciate the, the story that you've told about your own doubts, uh, having struggled myself with doubts and, and come out on the other end, uh, leave, leaving the faith. Uh, I was a Christian missionary with Wycliffe Bible Translators in Africa, in, in Niger, uh, which sadly is under the, in the throes of a, of a coup, coup d'etat right now. But um, anyway, back in 2000 is when I, when I uh, left the faith and, and came back to the US. Um, so I, I haven't read nearly as much as you have, obviously. And so I'm not an authority on the resurrection. I, I don't believe the resurrection occurred. Um, I'm kind of a partisan to uh, Bart Ehrman's views on a lot of those things. Um, but I, I did read the book by uh, Dale Allison, um, The Resurrection of Jesus. And on page uh, 507, uh, he recounts uh, a curious phenomenon of, of uh, rainbow bodies, uh, which yes. is a Latin tradition. I just wanted to read a couple paragraphs from that and get your take on it. All right. um, he, he goes on for pages and pages. Right. He does. He's got a whole chapter on it. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he says in an autobiographical account of his early life, Chogyam Trungpa, the famous 20th century Tibetan scholar and teacher, wrote these words. We have been told the story of a very saintly man who had died there the previous year in 1953. Just before his death, the old man said, when I die, you must not move my body for a week. This is all that I desire. They wrapped his dead body in old clothes and called in lamas and monks to recite and chant. The body was carried into a small room, little bigger than a cupboard, and it was noted that though the old man had been tall, the body appeared to have become smaller. At the same time, a rainbow was seen over the house. On the sixth day, on looking into the room, the family saw that it had, been, had grown smaller, still smaller. A funeral service was arranged for the morning of the eighth day, and men came to take the body to the cemetery. When they undid the coverings, there was nothing inside except nails and hair. The villagers were astounded, for it would have been impossible for anyone to have come into the room. The door was always kept locked, and the window of the little resting place was much too small. The family reported the event to the authorities and also went to ask Chedze Rupje, uh, Rinpoche about the meaning of it. He told them that such a happening had been reported several times in the past, and that the body of the saintly man had been absorbed into the light. They showed me the nails and the hair and the small room where they had kept the body. We had heard of such things happening, but never firsthand, so we went around the village to ask for, the, for further information. Everyone had seen the rainbow and knew that the body had disappeared. This village was on the main route from China to Lhasa, and the people told me that the previous year when the Chinese heard about it, they were furious and said the story must not be talked about. And this is where then uh, uh, Allison uh, kind of editorializes on it. He says, Christians are fond of affirming that the resurrection of Jesus is sui generis, or, or a unique um, thing in history. In the words of Ben Witherington, to date, there has been only one example of resurrection on this planet. If by this he means that Jesus is the only individual whose dead body has disappeared from this world and moved into some parallel universe or realm of being, then what of Trungpa's report? Witherington and like-minded others might reply that whereas the story in the New Testament is true, Trungpa's report is false. This is invariably the apologetical strategy apropos of the old tales about Romulus, Empedocles, Apollonius, etc. Such a response to Trungpa's story is, however, nothing but an uninformed prejudice if one knows nothing of the relevant sources. And then he goes on and tells even more stories, detailed stories, uh, very recent in 1998, it's one of them uh, occurring in the modern era, reported by many people, even people, uh, even men who who appeared to them later, according to prophecies, they, they appeared to, to, to their disciples later. So it wasn't just that they disappeared into thin air, they also came back and appeared to their disciples. So I won't read on and on, but that's, you know, that was long enough, but just wanted to get your take on that and how you would respond to Allison in his critique. Of, of you know, Dale and I have actually discussed it. I have a guy, a, a fella, he's, he's got a PhD down. He, he's a, a, he's a, um, teaches in a seminary in Florida, but he did a major research paper on this thing. And he gave like, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, like, 12 or 15 refutations. 
And here's some of the some of the issues. He said, for example, when does this story happen? And when are the first reports? If if we apply to them the same critiques that skeptics apply to us, some of these stories they accept them, but they're months old, they're they're too old. Uh, time is one. Here's another one. How would you know a rainbow over a house if you saw it? Did the rainbow come right down and sit in the house? Or was it up in the air and you go, let me see, that rainbow looks like it's over that house, but it's also Same over as you would see house. a star over a house in, Dr in Bethlehem, maybe. I don't know. Well, what I mean is a <laughs> rainbow over a guy's house would also be a rainbow over 500 other houses in the area. So rainbows same as a star over a, same as a, star over a, a manger in Bethlehem, I would imagine, right? God, who knows? Who knows? But I have here's the here's the point. I have no data for it, and I don't accept things without data. So, so and in these cases, I'm real skeptical of the appearance things. I want I would like to follow that up. I have followed up the story. Mm -hmm. uh, these are these are called apotheosis. They're not called resurrection stories. Apotheosis is when a a saint and when they mention Romulus and Remus, it was, ha it was supposed to have happened then. Mm -hmm. That's another thing. The earliest source that reports the Romulus and Remus thing is 200 years later. Now, as, the, as sources go, that's very, very early. The critics criticize us for the Gospel of John at plus 65, and they have no problem with the report 200 years later of Romulus and Remus, plus the fact that Romulus and Remus may never have lived. You go, people say that about Jesus too, but there's no early sources for these guys. So, and the apotheosis, here's another one. Nobody could have taken the body out of the room. Do you believe that? Do you believe nobody could have taken the body out of the room? Somebody has to have a key. Somebody has to live nearby. Somebody can pay somebody off and take it out. Somebody can do almost but anything. Why are, why are you so quick to try to find a, a solution, a naturalistic solution to this and not to the, you know, maybe Jesus, somebody stealing Jesus' body, whether disciples or anybody else outside of the disciples group? Um, you know, it, it seems like a double standard. Uh, well, okay. But what if I told you I was a skeptic for 20 years and mm -hmm. the second volume of my resurrection series is on alternative theories. Now, you just smile when I tell you this. You'll have to read it to, I mean, I'm not trying to say buy the book and give me money. I'm just saying that I, my research assistant did some uh, research. The longest treatment of naturalistic theories in print is Mike Lacona's doctoral dissertation with 250 pages. The next longest is 100. The second volume is alternative theories, refutations, and my manuscript is over a thousand pages long. So if you say, well, why didn't you check the other ones out? That's what I've done for 20 years. And that's what's in this book. I've got a thousand pages of refutations. And many times I won't quit. I told you earlier for hallucinations, I have, I have 19 refutations. So I would do the I I would be merciless with the resurrection as I was, the same way I would be with. And you say, why are you so fast to jump in? Because I was that fast to jump in when Christians told me it happened. That's just the way I am. I want to see, I want to see data. And these these examples. I mean, I, I like Dale, and we're good friends. I don't even think it's a challenging argument, let alone a good argument. Because I think, I think none of the corners are squared. It's like, how do I know someone didn't pay somebody off? How I didn't know somebody had a key? How do I know that they didn't, uh, someone came and took the body and moved it? How do I know that, 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 that? How do I know there weren't hallucinations? The same things they ask about, but we, we can have 15 or 20 refutations. And those cultures, I'll bet you they don't have half the data, just as data go, that would answer these. I, I, well, I mean, I didn't read all of it. There's a lot of uh, backing up of data and it's very recent. Uh, stuff uh, very well documented. Uh, yeah, it's not easy to dismiss. As, as I don't doubt it, reality. but by far, like probably ninety-five percent of them are apotheosis cases. They're not. They're not resurrection. So mm -hmm. I would know. I would wonder why they're even why they're well why they're even up there in the same uh, category. Well, I, I don't think. I think the larger point is not whether it was exactly the same as a, as a resurrection like Jesus. It's more. It's more trying to highlight the fact that. It depends on your tradition. If you're, if you're amenable to the idea that Jesus rose from the dead, then it, it seems that you're much more. Uh, and again, in your case, you were a skeptic, so I grant you that. But I think in a lot of a lot of cases, there's a prior desire for it to be true, and then you try to kind of um, back it up. Whereas, whereas if you find something from another tradition that seems far-fetched, like you know, 
resurrection of the dead is is far fetched inherently when you when you just start to think about it because it's we don't experience it in our day, day, daily lives. Uh, a rainbow body is also far fetched, but it's from a different tradition. So you don't find a Ben Witherington going in and trying to support it. You, you're you're what instead the, the the reflex is to try to discredit it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I have a question for you, Daniel. From your uh, from your perspective, um, uh, are, are you are you making the argument that um, the rainbow bodies story is uh, did not probably happen, or are you saying because it seems like it's an argument for the supernatural, not an argument against the supernatural? Oh uh, well, I guess my larger point is it it, it seems to be uh, there there's a a double standard at play in terms of apologists who who want to dismiss this. I'm not. Well, I, don't I believe, understand I don't that part. Either but one but happened. Okay, that's record, that was my question. Okay, okay, um, that, that was my question. So, so I, I understood the part that you that it was a double yeah. standard. I, I think you yeah. made a good point on that. And so we we want to. And if I understood correctly, uh, Ken, what uh, Gary was saying, I think he was saying that um, he he did. Um, treat all those possible um, objections very seriously initially, and it feel, feels like he's answered them all sufficiently. So maybe what well, you're Dale saying Allison is he should is try open. just as hard to to yeah. um, support the Rainbow Bodies theories uh, experiences as well. Yeah, Dale Allison is personally agnostic about it. He's open to the possibility that these are you know real occurrences because he can't find an explanation for it himself. Um, just like he's open to the idea that Jesus rose from the dead, but he he can't prove one either one. He he, he finds them both interesting, um, so he's he's noncommittal about what. Why do you say happened. Why do you say Dale is open to both when he starts with sentences in both his books saying, "I believe Jesus was raised from the dead, appeared oh, to his disciples." Yeah, he I don't saw think, them. He saw him, and I'll be. Yeah, I'll be I think church. he's talking about in a, a spiritual. Uh, uh, apparition uh, apparition or appearance i don't think dale allison believes in a physical resurrection of jesus well he he's a little bit agnostic on that on, on what yeah. Dewey takes but yeah uh, he doesn't he doesn't come down but he does say mm -hmm. he does say that the new testament paul peter they all believe they all claim they were bodily appearances dale will grant that yeah fact, yeah almost everybody does today uh yeah. i had a i had one of the top skeptics in the country an atheist actually who studied this told me that the latest figure that he's aware of is that 85% of trained New Testament skeptics, 85% think the appearances were bodily. And that would be really different. Um, and I, but I wonder, oh, by the way, in the, in Dale's, I'm losing my books, uh, in Dale's purple, blue, whatever it is, book, he does have a line at the back of the book He's, and I can find out and send you the page number if you want. But he says, in all of my studies I've of, of the supernatural, he's got other ones in the book too, right? You know where he's people, he's he's had near-death like uh, uh, experiences in his family. His right. father, his wife saw his father after she died. There's a bunch of those. He's got several in his family. He wrote a whole book called Encountering Mystery recently. Right. It's more recent than this Correct. book. Uh, I read that one as well. Yeah, so he's an cool. interesting guy. He is. But here's my here's my thing. At the end of the book, he says, of all the possible views, he says there is no there is no comet in history that I'm trying to well, I won't take time to find it. I can send you a page, but it's, he says it twice. He says, in all the world religions I've studied and all the different perspectives. I have never seen it all come together like a jigsaw puzzle. He says there's nothing in history where all the loose ends meet. There's no case like the resurrection case. He said it's by far the strongest case. And now knowing Dale, he'd say, well, but just because I told you that, I'm going to have another question. That's Dale. But he says of all the cases, the resurrection is by far the strongest case. It fits together like a jigsaw puzzle, and he does not know an answer. He does not know an answer to that big jigsaw thing that says, "Look how everything fits with the with the um, oddly appearance and empty tomb." I think we ought to read the book as a club. That would be a really good one to read. Um, he he does take apologists, uh, resurrection apologists, to task for overplaying their hand and and trying he to does. make it 
a claim that they they can't legitimately support. And maybe maybe we think he takes the skeptical claim a little too strong. You know that yeah. that goes back and forth. Right. I'm I'm trying to see if before we're done here, if I can read that to you, I might be able to find the page number before we go here. But but he himself, even after giving the the, the uh, uh, Buddhist theory as nobody else before has. He says it's not as good a case as the resurrection. That's what he's saying. He says the resurrection is the best case in all my studies. Yeah, I'd be interested that to follow that page number because it the tenure. Yeah, there's, there's tenor, he says it. He says it twice. Uh, yeah, I, he, he's, to me, he seemed to take a little more skeptical stance, but um, you know, it could be wrong. Go ahead. I I can listen if anybody has a question, but. Did I disappear or something? Yeah, hang on just a second. We had a technical All right. issue. All right. Okay, you're back. Put, uh, you need to kind of put your camera down just a little bit there, Gary. Sorry about that. We're just about out of time. So if uh, if um, if you did you find that uh, quote you wanted to read, Gary? Oh, you go ahead and talk, and if I find it quickly, okay. I'll well, let, let me go ahead and, and talk about uh, what we have coming up. Um, uh, we we are, are going to um, postpone our book club for uh, September. And so just we want to make a note, our, our next meeting will be um, October 5th. And uh, this has been on the calendar for a while. Uh, we're going to be uh, having two guest authors at the same time, Doug Groteist and uh, Ike Shepherdson. And uh, we're going to be looking at their book, The Knowledge of God in the Word. Uh, I'm sorry, The Knowledge of God in the World and in the Word. Uh, Doug Groteist is a PhD from University of Oregon, is professor of philosophy at Denver Seminary. Uh, he heads up the Apologetics and Eth Ethics Master's Degree program there. His um, article has been published in numerous uh, journals. He's written uh, quite a few books, including uh, textbook Christian Apologetics, uh, Truth Decay, love that title. And then uh, this is intriguing. One of his books is Philosophy in Seven Sentences. Now, that's my kind of book when you can read that whole section in seven sentences and have that chapter knocked out. Uh, so, uh, and I think he's got another book he's working on in that same uh, seven sentence uh, format. So the other co-author who will, is planning to be with us uh, that night, uh, Thursday, October 5th, is Ike Shepherdson. He has a PhD from the U University of Toronto. He leads the BA and MA programs in applied apologetics at Colorado Christian University. He's also associate faculty with um, at Denver Seminary uh, with Doug. Uh, he's an elder at Living Way Fellowship uh, in uh, Highlands, Highlands Ranch, Colorado. Uh, his work's been published in uh, Philosophia Christi, Quandrum, the Denver Journal, uh, Orthodoxy and Dialogue, other journals as well. And uh, he's co-author of that book, Knowledge of God in the World and the Word. So just uh, be keeping a lookout on our Atheist and Christian Book Club uh, Facebook page or Friends of Athe Atheist and Christian Book Club. Also, if you go to our, our website in a, in a couple of days at atheistchristianbookclub.com, you'll be able to have access to links to the book. Hey, James, that's, video. Yes. that's the fellow I met in Tallahassee, wasn't it? I Yes, yes, Doug. Yeah. We had breakfast with him we as well, breakfast. and you, you tried to talk to him about apologetics saying, and philosophy. Yeah, I, said, yeah, I wrote a book on that. Apologetics is where you try to defend your, and he goes, yeah, I know I wrote a book on it. I'm a professor <laughs> at Denver Center. So he goes, I'll send you a book. So he was really nice. He sent me a book. And I read it. It's a fantastic book. Uh, just, I couldn't put it down. It was terrific. Now, is that the one he sent you, the same book? Uh Oh, it might not it be. His, um, yeah, I, got I, somewhere I, I think he sent you the uh, his textbook on apologetics. I think is what he might. I think have sent that you. might be it. You're right. Yeah. Right. Right. So, but uh, looking forward to that. That will be again October fifth. And uh, Gary, did you you have that quote for us? I do. There's three of them in here, and I've got all three of them. Um. Here's uh, on page three forty six. There's this one. He says. Um, 
I know of no close phenomenological parallel to a series of likely events as a whole. Early Christianity offers, and then he goes on and says, they offer all this kind of stuff. And then he says, taken as a whole, this is, on any account, a remarkable, e even extraordinary confluence of events and claims. If there is a good, substantial parallel to the entire series, I have yet to run across it. So there's one comment. Um, here's another one. He says, uh, different views can offer different coming and going here, but by contrast, the Orthodox proposition, this is page 344, the Orthodox proposition, God raised Jesus from the dead, explains all the data at a single stroke and so has greater explanatory power. That's the second one. And the third one is page 356. We're getting into his conclusions now. And he says, Apologists will reflexively protest with justice that such an explanation, talking about ghosts and things, they will protest that such an explanation demands an extraordinary confluence of remarkable uh, circumstances. Then he makes a comment, and then he says, on the contrary, the world being chaotic is full of surprises. But he says, the apologist will answer with justice that the other views are coming in with different pieces, but Christianity has the whole thing together. God raised Jesus from the dead, confirming his message, therefore his message is true. It's all like in, in one. I, I think of the three, I think the strongest one is the one on page, um, what is it, 346? Um, yeah, taken as a whole. This is, on any account, a remarkable, even extraordinary confluence of events and claims, he means Christianity and the evidences. If there is a good, substantial parallel to the entire series, I have yet to run across it. Well, Gary, I, a couple, uh, I'd like you to do something for me. If you, if you move your camera down just a little bit, and since we are completely out of time, I, I want to thank everybody for being part of the club, but especially for this uh, second time to be our guest author. Uh, you've been with us in person also, I believe, at the uh, at the book club as well. So uh, do you have any parting advice or words, encouragement for both the atheists and the Christians here at the club uh, that you want to leave us with, Gary? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll take it both ways. And one, I haven't keyed on too much. But the first thing I would say is the argument that that Dale just used. If we put all of our evidence together, take whatever thought systems, religions, anything, philosophies that you think are rivals, and then ask which one, including the Buddhist account, which one explains all the data the fullest with the best empirical evidence? Which one? And see if your conclusion comes anywhere close to, um, to Dale's. My other one is to go in reverse. I'll be glad to send you guys that essay where I argue, and it's way over this now, I published it with Blackwell back about 2016, Secular Press, and I was referring to 300 evidenced NDEs. And some of these, near-death experiences, and some of these are, are so incredible. I would like an atheist to give a critique against the best NDE guys because they generally don't get to first base. I mean, I'm dead serious. It's like a shut and close case. I told... Um, the editor of my book, I got a second article coming out of this in a book with intelligent design. And I told the author, and I could have been refuted, he's a physicist, and he's one of the ID guys. And I said, hey, I may be wrong. But I said, you know, disbelieve me if you want. But I think there's more evidence for the NDE argument than there is to the intelligent design argument. Now, that's a lot to be said, but there's a lot of moving parts here. And now, why am I suggesting this? I'd say go about it the back door. And this is what Dale, when he did was nice enough to write that blurb for my book and say, Gary's NDE afterlife plus resurrection argument is a new path to resurrection. Okay. First, just look at NDEs. And that would be Buddhist. That would be anything you want to include and see if there's an afterlife. I think it's pretty much irrefutable. And that's a topic that next to the resurrection, I've done more study on than any other one. And if there's an afterlife, 
what are you going to do with the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus? Because unlike the to me, the Buddhist and other stories, um, it, with Jesus, there's a worldview involved. He makes claims. He claims to be the son of God, claims to be Lord, he died for it. And he he gives us this solution and he says, my rising from the dead is going to prove what I say is true. Then he rises from the dead. So if there is an afterlife, why shouldn't I think that the resurrection is the best evidenced form of it? But for you who are atheists and agnostics, that's a problem of its own. If there is an afterlife, what do you do with the afterlife on your worldview? That's a yeah, own and, challenge. And, and we will also, if you give us your email and the text, we will yep. make sure you get that as well as the um, the two podcasts that we did with Gary, the video on, on NDEs. And in that, you know, and Gary, you and I have talked about this. You know, I came to you uh, as a big skeptic because of all the um, the disproven cases that I've seen in NDE. You know, people Betty Eady, embraced by the light, uh, the Malarkey yeah. kid, the Christian kid that turned to come to find out his father wrote the story as in book form, and and his uh, the 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 victim later refuted it. My dad made it all up; it never happened. So you see all this, and so I was wanting to throw the whole thing out and just not even take it seriously. And what you told me is. Yeah, there's quite a bit of it that that is uh, fraudulent or can be explained in other ways, but there is a percentage that is very, very difficult to refute. And so, I, I, that if if you want to know more about the NDE on that, please give us your email address in the in the text remarks, and we will get those podcasts to you. And um, we are already seven minutes over. Listen, thank you so much, those of you. Raise your hand if this if you if you are uh, this is your first atheist and Christian book club. Wait, raise your hand. Let us see that first one. Great, thank you for being welcome to the club, Gary. Thank you for being back with us, and uh, we look forward to seeing you guys in October. Thanks so much, guys. James, can I make one last yeah. point here? About sure, sure, Gary. When I, when I send you guys this this essay. Ken, in particular, take note that there, last time I counted, and it's years ago, there are now over three dozen cases, NDE cases, where the person who had the NDE had no brain activity and no heart activity as far as our best machines can determine. So the person has no brain, no heart, and during that interval of, uh, say, 15 minutes, say, 30 minutes, sometimes they were for three hours, they report things that can be verified by police reports, but they're out at the time. They're out, they're out without heart and without brain. How do we explain the likelihood? I'm not saying it's 100% proof, but how do we explain a flat brain, flat heart reading that reports evidence that occurred at the same time? When you get dozens of those, I think I'm ready to say this world is a lot bigger, more complicated place than I think. And uh, it's looking alike, like, or answer the other question. Why did 32% of the atheists and agnostics in that recent poll say they believe in an afterlife? Why in the world is that? So I'd like to see how that was worded as well. Maybe we can get that out to you in that same email. Thanks so much. And we will see you guys at the next uh, Atheist and Christian Book Club. Great questions, folks.